Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I think you all us know me well, I guess. <laughs> anyway, so so it's a good time to talk because last week was a global awareness for air treatment relation week. So it's a good time to talk about in that in November time frame. But uh, um, I'm gonna go over some you know, uh, what's atrial fibrillation? Why is it important and what we need to do to prevent it or to treat it? So let's start, it's, a, it's one of the most common arrhythmias. I'm sure everybody heard the name arrhythmias, right? That's like irregular heart rhythm, erratic heart rhythm. And, uh, you know, there are certain technical terminologies such as, I think this, is, this, this doesn't work usually because of the screen. I think anyway, that's okay. No, no. The, uh, Pointer. Oh. Yeah, so, uh, you know, but again, it's just, uh, you know, electrical abnormality inside the heart. And I'll explain a little bit further how it works and why it happened. But again, you know, the important thing is that it's, uh, in, it's very prevalent in the general population. 1% between age 60 to 64, but then it goes up significantly as we grow older and in up to 9 to 10% in the population over age 80. And it's responsible for 15% of the stroke because how, why it's important because atrial fibrillation can develop a blood clot inside the heart and it, that dislodge causes the stroke. So we'll go over that, how it works, why we need to, what we need to do to prevent that. So again, uh, as you see this by 2011 is 3 million, but by now 2020, it's about 5 million people in the US with, with their atrial fibrillation. And it's growing uh, rapidly. So by 2050, up to 16 million people will have it. Um, hospitalization uh, up to 66% increase in the last 20 years. And you know, in the hospital, when someone is critically ill, they will develop atrial fibrillation in about uh, you know one third of the cases. Again, same thing, grow with the age and the sex. Of course, the male has slightly high uh, you know, prevalence compared to female women. But again, as we grow older, the higher incidence, as you can see in this uh, demo, uh, depiction. So this is uh, you know, just to get an idea about what happened in atrial fibrillation. That's the normal heart. As you see, the impulse from the heart, right, with the pulse generates from one area goes to the other, and that's how it grows from upper chamber to the lower chamber. While in atrial fibrillation, it just swirls around inside the upper chamber of the heart. And not all the impulses goes down. Only few of them, or only one third of the impulse goes down, the other two remain inside. So that's why the heart rate becomes fast, and it doesn't go down, as we said, you know, it doesn't integrate it properly inside. So the heart, upper and lower chamber, doesn't talk to each other. It should be in synchrony, just what you see right here. Each one goes down and comes back up here, more on the top than on the down, and they just uh, you know squeeze haphazardly rather than in synchronized fashion. And that's important because because of that, you know there are swirling of the blood inside the heart rather than squeezing on regular fashion. And if that happened, you know there are certain nukes and corners inside the heart where blood stays and becomes stagnant and become a blood clot inside. So that's why someone with atrial fibrillation need to be on blood thinner. That will go over that in detail a little bit later, what need to be done and why. So what is the big deal? It, I mean, because as I mentioned that, you know, the top, which is an atrium of the heart, which is a top two chamber, fires at rate of 150, 160, but only one third or one half of the impulse goes down into the lower part of the heart, which is called ventricle. So they, again, and don't squeeze and synchronize fashion and ultimately it can cause some stagnation and some blood clot development on the left side of the heart it's called left atrial appendage which doesn't squeeze when the heart squeezes because it's just a corner of the heart where the blood stays and become blood you know cause the blood clot now if that <clears throat> blood clot dislodge and goes to the brain and that's where it causes the stroke and why it goes to the brain because when the heart squeezes, the blood goes out through this aortic valve, and this aortic valve is right in direct connection with the neck artery. It's called carotid artery, and and that's where the blood uh, uh, blood clot goes all the way up to the brain. So this is the just a picturization. So that's the left side of the upper chamber, left side of the lower chamber, and this is called left atrial appendage. 
where 90% of the blood clot related to atrial fibrillation can occur. And most of the stroke cause from that part of the, you know, the heart where, you know, it not squeezing forms the blood clot. And if that dislodge, directly goes to the brain. And that's why someone with atrial fibrillation, depending on their other risk factor that will go or that needs to be on blood thinner to keep the blood thin so it doesn't develop the blood clot and it doesn't dislodge and goes to the brain to cause the stroke. Again, this is just a picturization as mentioned earlier, how the normal heart and the, you know, the, the electrical impulse goes down, what happened in the re-entry, which is like, you know, in the atrial fibrillation, it just, uh, you know, multiple ways to do it. So now it, it, it's an electrical problem, right? So if someone have a heart attack, it's a plumbing problem because it blocks the heart arteries. But this is not an artery. This is an electrical issues inside the heart. So as you can see, it's a complex uh, machine, the heart, which means 365, God knows how many years, right? As long as we alive. But so what happened when this electrical system issue happened, there is some changes, right? I mean, when you have anything different than normal, there is always some changes develop inside the muscles of the heart or you know upper chamber of the heart and what we call as the electrical remodeling. So anything beats more than usual, then that part get tired over a period of time. So that's what it happens in generalized term called remodeling. Uh, you know, it can be all the time, it can, can be, you know, on and off. So there are certain definitions that, uh, you know, we'll go over that in a minute. But again, earlier the treatment you do, earlier the recognition, earlier the prevention, you prevent this remodeling and prevention of the permanent damage to that part of the heart. So what are the etiology, meaning what can cause that real fibrillation? And most, most common causes, as we as I mentioned earlier, the age, right? As we grow older, the higher chance of atrial fibrillation. But that is just age-related. But then what is underlying? Anybody with the high blood pressure, anyone with the valvular heart disease, like, you know, the valves inside the heart, whether it's leaky or tight, that can cause it. Skin heart disease, meaning that anything plumbing issue, blockage that can cause dysfunction of the heart can cause atrial fibrillation. Cardiomyopathy is like, again, dysfunction of the heart muscle, which could be related to the high blood pressure. And again, in other term, it's called congestive heart failure. That can also lead to atrial fibrillation. Inflammation of the heart, any congenital heart disease, like this is from birth or post-operative like anyone can get open heart surgery, they are also have a higher risk and more predisposed to have a real fibrillation because as you can cut and do the bypass, you can have some sort of changes in the heart muscle and can cause electrical system issue. Some other non-cardiac related cause, lungs, right? In multiple pneumonias or COPD, those who are smoker in the past and have lung damage or blockage in the lung artery called pulmonary embolism all those can predispose to atrial fibrillation. Someone with a thyroid problem, hyperthyroid, where the low, the level of the thyroid hormone is very low, something you must have heard called goiter, that can also lead to atrial fibrillations. Certain other, you know, enzyme, you know, the, the level of the catecholamines, which are the enzymes in the body, of course, drugs, alcohol, and other electrolyte imbalance, such as high potassium, low potassium, magnesium, all those can lead to atrial fibrillation. Again, this is just a mnemonic of pirates, you know, same thing, you know, the ischemia, pulmonary, alcohol, thyroid, you know, electrolytes or infection or sepsis. So something called lone atrial fibrillation, what it, what it means is that someone is young, no underlying heart condition or risk factor as mentioned earlier, like, you know, the blood pressure or ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathy, pericarditis, alcohol. There are not much of any structural or no other associated comorbidities. So it's something called lone atrial fibrillation that comes and goes once in a while for no other reason. And, you know, again, you know, it could be paroxysmal, meaning it comes and goes over a period of time, lasts for a few days, less than seven days, few hours, and then goes away. Sometimes you may feel it, sometimes you may not feel anything. Uh, and other classification is something called paroxysmal, which is intermittent. You know, and in when when you have recurrent episode more than two, that's where the, the definition comes in. And usually it terminates by itself. You may feel palpitation for a couple hours and then it goes away. And then you feel, I mean, if you check your pulse, it's irregularly irregular, like bup, 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 instead of bup, bup, 
top of that's the regular heart rate or blood, you know, the pulse rate. This is irregularly irregular, but terminates within a few days of, you know, but usually within 24 hours, but less than seven days. It's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And, uh, you know, something called persistent, which is like it's failed to, his, you know, stop or, you know, resolve within uh, or, you know, terminate within seven days. It lasts a little longer and you need to act on it as a, as a, us as a physician. Either we need to do something called cardioversion, meaning we shock the patient to bring back to regular rhythm under anesthesia, or you give the medicine such as amiodarone, for example, or there are certain other medications such as flaconide or, you know, some other medications that can convert that to regular rhythm. If it's not converted by itself, then it's called persistent atrial fibrillation and something called permanent, which is like a forever, you know, chronic atrial fibrillation or permanent atrial fibrillation. Uh, you have attempted cardioversion for persistent and then it comes back, you know, it's not stayed in regular rhythm, but then went back into atrial fibrillation or someone never have attempted and they are in all the time in atrial fibrillation. That's called permanent atrial fibrillation. So what are the signs and symptoms? So 30% of the cases we find as an incidental finding. As you come to doctor, oh, you are in irregular rhythm. So that's how we find. They are not having any symptoms. A lot of them are asymptomatic, but other main symptoms are palpitations, like, you know, heart beating fast. I mean, patient explained at all, just coming out of your body. Like that's what you feel like, bah, 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 and it's irregular. So you may feel it that way. And because of so fast and heart doesn't squeeze regularly, you get short of breath because it doesn't get enough blood flow to the rest of the body. You get tired for the same reason. And, you know, again, poor ventricular function, which is the heart function, because heart doesn't squeeze on regular fashion because upper chamber is squeezing this and lower is squeeze, it squeeze fast and this squeezing slow. So, you know, you don't get enough blood flow to the rest of the body. And because of that, you know, Sometimes your blood pressure drops, you may feel dizzy and lightheaded. You know, you also get chest pain because when the heart contracts, the blood is flowing also to the heart arteries. And if heart doesn't get good contraction or it's very fast contraction, then you don't get enough blood flow to the heart arteries and you get the chest pain. So again, you know, palpitations, tachycardia, which is fast heartbeat, tired, fatigue, dizzy, lightheaded. Because of that, you will get reduced exercise capacity you know, chest pain, which is angina, dizziness, which is presyncope, and again, stroke, embolic, embolic event, heart failure, lower extremity swelling, you know, all those symptoms. Or sometimes you don't have symptoms at all. In many, many young patients with atrial fibrillation, they don't feel anything. So this is how it looks like on EKG when we do EKG. Or nowadays, everybody has Apple Watch, right? When you have a, you know, uh, something called uh, EKG stressing. If someone has Apple Watch with this, this kind of uh, software inside, you can put your finger right on the side and you can stress your heart rate. And it will tell you that whether you have atrial fibrillation or not. It's very specifically for atrial fibrillation. So a lot of patients are using that just to see when they feel something, they want to check and see whether they are in atrial fibrillation or not, which is very important now. In your case, you know, when you were saying that comes and goes now, there are many in devices my available. Watch was going crazy. Huh? My watch was going crazy. When? When I had an episode. Yeah. I had a no. few. I've had yes, a few. absolutely. And the now, you know, there are a lot of other devices also can immediately recognize it. So, which is important to know because, I mean, you know, nowadays, you know, you don't have to go to the, as you said, go to the ER to get EKG. You can have this one and we can look at it and you can diagnose whether you are in atrial fibrillation. So again, you, usually when you have that, you have a fast heartbeat, heart rate in range of 120 to 130, 140. So you, you, you may feel it, you know, irregularity, fast heartbeat. But in someone with permanent atrial or, you know, and in chronic atrial fibrillation, usually is well controlled because of the medications and nature of the disease, which is chronic for many years, your heart rate may be in 60s and 70s. So you may not feel palpitation, but it's irregular. So same EKG is very irregular. As you can see, that's uh, from this to this, they are not in the same, you know, distance. So that's how we diagnose with atrial fibrillation. So again, how you diagnose, of course, the history. When patient tells that you're feeling palpitations, right? So you have to check and make sure what's the heart rate and rhythm, and you have to do EKG. Physical exam, you can listen to them and you can hear the irregularity. You can, when you, when you check the pulse, you will see, you definitely feel irregular heart rate. That's atrial fibrillation. That's very common 
way to diagnose. Um, again, if someone with a new onset, newly diagnosed, first time, you have to make sure that there is no underlying heart condition. You have to do an X-ray, EKG, echocardiogram to check the function, the valves, and you know, as mentioned, because all those can contribute to atrial fibrillation. Of course, you need to check the thyroid level, PSA, whether to make sure it's no high or low. Someone in young patient with history of alcohol abuse or ingestion, you have to make sure they are not intoxicated at the time of the atrial fibrillation because there is a, we don't use it anymore, but there is a definition or phenomena called holiday heart syndrome. What it means is that if someone is drinking over the weekend and then Monday they will come to the hospital with palpitation and they are in atrial fibrillation because of excessive alcohol use. That's usually you treat the underlying condition, meaning you know, get rid of alcohol and you don't get into atrial fibrillation. So this usually happens in a young patients, uh, you know, but we have seen few times, but again, that's something that, you know, one should be aware of that, you know, check the label and make sure it's not the cause. So what do you do and how do you approach again, you know, as I mentioned earlier that uh, in the hospital acutely ill patient, one third of them will have at real fibrillation at some point in time while they are in the hospital and they are critically ill. So if you treat the underlying condition such as infection or in lung pulmonary embolism, and again, effective treatment of the primary condition will restore the regular rhythm. And then we have to decide then what next, how to prevent that to happen again, and what needs to be done if something is going on and off. But again, the main objective is to restoration of the regular rhythm, which is very important, one way or other. Because if, if your heart, even it's chronic atrial fibrillation and it's not squeezing in a synchronized fashion, you're not getting enough blood flow to the rest of your body. Of course, the lower the heart rate is better. That mimic like you are in regular rhythm. But, uh, you know, restoration of the regular sinus rhythm, when possible, as I said here, is very important. Prevention of the recurrent atrial fibrillation, optimization of the heart rate during the episode of atrial fibrillation. So you control the heart rate, you keep it down as down as possible in 1780s, but definitely less than 100. And reduce risk of thromboembolization, which is prevention of the stroke. You know, Because of the blood clot develop in the heart, you have to make sure that you treat that accordingly. And of course, treatment of underlying conditions such as uh, hyperthyroidism or alcoholism or anything like that. So how do you treat each one of them, such as like paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, right? Most lot of time is well tolerated and doesn't require any treatment because it comes and goes in short period of time and you may not feel anything. But beta blockers such as metoprolol, you must have heard the name, it's very important to control that and prevent that to happen again and again. You know, and some certain other medications such as propafenone, flaconide, you know, also very effective. But again, one has to be careful, you know, you don't have to have underlying condition then you can't use those drugs. You know, for, for persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation, right? Paroxysmal is a little bit easy to treat, recognize it and treat them and control it. It's important to treat because as I mentioned, you don't know when it comes and goes. But persistent and permanent, there are two ways to treat them. You know, rhythm control, meaning that either you in atrial fibrillation and convert it to the sinus rhythm or Rate control, meaning that you're not able to control, I mean, convert them to the sinus rhythm, regular rhythm, then you make sure that you control the rate, keep it as low as possible. So that's the rate control. So again, it's a debate, right? I mean, you know, but again, certain trials, they have done the rate control versus rhythm control, and then they have shown no mortality benefit from those things. So either one is okay. But we know that from experience that the, the rhythm control is important, meaning you control in order to convert to the regular rhythm, but you cannot, then you keep it in a control heart rate, rate control. So either one of them is okay. None of them will show the improvement in the mortality. So what do you do for rhythm control? So if you are, you know, at you know, attempt successfully at atrial fibrillation less than three months in patient, you know, and no you know, no structural heart disease. So you try to control the rhythm, meaning you convert them to the regular rhythm. You know, again, you can do it by, as I mentioned, pharmacological, which is medications. You give them by either outpatient or in the hospital, or you do the cardioversion, like shocking the patient, electrical cardioversion under anesthesia. So that will bring them into the sinus rhythm. The electrical cardioversion is 75% successful. 
Um, and if it's the first episode, not well controlled with the medicine, you can give the blood thinner and convert them in the hospital immediately within 48 hours. Uh, again, certain medicines such as flaconide I mentioned earlier, you can infuse over a period of two hours, but these are all done in the hospital. You know, um, and you know, during the cardio version, depending on the duration of the atrial fibrillation, you need to be anticoagulated, meaning you need to be on a blood thinner before and after for cardio version. So, you know, you have to be there four weeks before and three months after the blood thinner even though you don't require long-term blood thinning agents. So there's certain things that is technical and make sure that you do certain things for protocol in order to prevent the, you know. Uh, but if you have a blood clot, you cannot do cardioversion because when you have a blood clot, you need to treat that first and make sure the blood clot is resolved before you do the cardioversion. Otherwise, when you shock someone, the blood clot definitely can dislodge that heart reset and it then goes to the brain and cause to them. The rate control medicine, I'm sure every, I mean, many of you have heard of it's a digoxin, beta blockers such as metoprolol, calcium channel blockers such as verapamil or ditazam. These are all works on the certain, it's called AV node, which is a, you know, epicenter of the heartbeat. It, it, that's where the heartbeat generates and it works on there to control the heart rate. So these are all rate control medications. Certain combination medications are also very important. And there are certain things that uh, we can go over if you need permanently, you know, get rid of atrial fibrillation, you can do something called ablation. Or even ablation doesn't work, you can do called AV node ablation and then put a permanent pacemaker. So there are certain things that can be done for some patient whose heart rate is not very well controlled in spite of no matter what you do. So then you need to do certain things in order to control the heart rate. So catheter ablation is like, you know, if, as I said, the medications are ineffective, right? And no matter what you do, you cardio work, you give the medicine, still they are in atrial fibrillation, they are still having very fast heartbeat and you're not able to control it, then you can, or the medication causing side effects. Or someone on blood thinner cannot be on blood thinner because of the bleeding issue or fall issue, or, there are, or simply they don't want to take the medicine, which is the last resort, but you can do the ablation. But again, ablation does not remove the blood thinner. You still need to be on blood thinner because, because it's not 100%. Still, you can have atrial fibrillation on and off. So you still need to be on blood thinner even after the ablation. So what they do is, uh, you know, they, the, the most of the impulses by now, we know more about atrial fibrillation is coming from pulmonary vein in the left atrium side of the upper chamber of the left side of the heart. And you know you can isolate them and you can ablate. So if that does not complete the circuit, it's a it's a re-entrant phenomena. So it doesn't complete the circuit in electrical system. You ablate that in the middle so that you know there is a scar situ so that the electrical circuit it's not completed and you're not getting atrial fibrillation. So as a seventy percent of the patient, uh, you know, uh, and, and some of them may require repeat procedure. Certain risk always involved with this kind of uh, these are invasive procedures. So risks are always there, but again, you have to weigh the risk and benefit, right? What is important? What's good for the patient? You have to decide. So here is the, just a you know, small picture of how they do catheter ablation. You go from the groin inside the right atrium through the middle septum of the between upper two chamber of the heart and then go into the left side. And you, those are the four pulmonary veins. You isolate them with the mapping catheter and you do the ablation line meaning that see the circuit has to be incomplete when you ablate that so that the electrical impulse doesn't make a full circle to get re-entry again and again. So you isolate all those four pulmonary veins and then you ablate in the middle when you when you have a mapping catheter in there. So it's a, it's a very, uh, I wouldn't say complex procedure, but it's a complex, uh, you know, ideology, how, how it works, but it works very good in many patients. And something I mentioned earlier that if nothing works, right, and heart rate is still remain fast, the so last resort is called is the AV node ablation. So this is an area where you, that AV node is, which is an epicenter of the impulses. So you complete ablate that node, but when you ablate that, there is no pulse, right? So that's where you need a permanent pacemaker 
upper and lower chamber to generate the pulse by, by artificially to keep the heart beating. So once you have that, you are on pacemaker dependent and you always have a pacemaker. But I mean, you know, sometimes it's very important to do that procedure in order to keep going. Otherwise, patient cannot function. They are very disabled because of fast heartbeat and not able to control the heart rate. So something called, you know, as it says, CHATS2 vascor. What does that mean? C means congestive heart failure, H means hypertension, A means age, which has a two point, D means diabetes, S means previous stroke or mini stroke, which has two point. V means vascular disease, such as heart attack, peripheral vascular disease, which has one point, H, 65 to 75 as one point, and uh, sex as many as one point. So total nine points here. So this is a very important table to determine who will need a blood thinner agent. It's called checks to Vasco. So the more the point, the higher the risk of stroke, as it as it down there in my next slide as well, which I'll go over that. But when we see a patient with atrial fibrillation is, you know, whether it's a lone atrial fibrillation, holiday heart syndrome, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. But again, this is the key table to determine how to prevent the stroke. If someone is 45 year old, few episodes of atrial fibrillation and no underlying whatsoever, no underlying heart condition, they will not need a blood thinner because their score probably is zero. They don't have anything else. But if someone is 75 year old with hypertension and diabetes, they are already falling to the four points because age more 75, hypertension and diabetes, it's already one and one. In case if, if they are, I mean, I mean, female probably have one point, not the male, but female has a higher risk of having atrial fibrillation after a certain age. So depending on what are the risk factors, the risk of stroke is goes up in patient with atrial fibrillation. And so zero, one is 1.3, but if you goes beyond four and five, the stroke risk is significant, around five to 10% per year. So one out of uh, 10 out of 100 or one out of 10 will get a stroke if they have a lot of risk factors. So depending on what we see and any patient we see with atrial fibrillation, this is the key to determine whether they need to be on blood thinner or not. If you start on a blood thinner, you have to be see, you have to make sure that what are the risks of bleeding, right? Because blood thinner can cause bleeding. Most of the time in the stomach, gastritis, but it's occasionally it can cause the bleeding in the brain. So you have to, you know, have to have make sure that these are the things you have to make sure and weigh the risk and benefit. What are what are the chances of having them bleed? So you know you have to monitor patient constantly, check the blood work periodically, and you know again high blood pressure you know, the liver function, the stroke history, the bleeding history, you know, female, I mean, elderly patient more than 65 here, or if someone is on, you know, warfarin, which we don't use that often, um, you know, what's their level of the INR, which is under control or labile, all those things counts towards the bleeding risk. And you have to weigh the risk and benefit whether, what are the important thing, whether, whether patient will continue to be on blood thinner or they can be treated other ways because if someone cannot take the blood thinner because of the high risk of bleeding, then there are there is a new treatment availability at present time in last few years. And uh, I'll just jump into that. It's called left atrial appendage closure, right? So left atrium, remember that one the corner of the heart which developed the blood clot and responsible for 90% of the stroke. You put this cap on that right here, as you see, go inside the, from the groin into the heart and put a cap on that so that blood clot does not go out and cause the stroke. So if someone cannot take the blood thinner, there is an option now to put this left atrial appendage closer, even though they are in atrial fibrillation, even though the blood clot develops in the left atrium, you can cap those, uh, you know, cap that, you know, corner with the closure and you know you prevent the stroke by doing that. But you know the medication point of view, we used to give warfarin all the time until last uh, I would say eight to ten years. We have excellent new medication, and most of the time we use those last two medications called Zeralto or Elipase. And I'm sure everybody must have heard the commercial on the TV those medications about. And you know they work through the kidney, kidney and liver. 
And, uh, you know, uh, they works on a standardized dose. You don't need to check any blood work for the label of that uh, drug. And uh, you, there is no restriction for any food or any medication. So it works very well. And again, I think these are very old medications that uh, still a lot of patients are on because those are newer medications and very expensive and certain insurance doesn't cover. So we still are putting patient on warfarin called Coumadin. And for that, you need to check the INR and it's a red poison, as you can see that. And, you know, and it works very well in a patient who, who are very, you know, conscious, uh, you know, taking it regularly, very compliant with the medication because it requires to check the blood level every two to four weeks. It's called INR, International Standardized Ratio, Normalized Ratio, it's called INR. And that has to be checked and has to be between two and three in order to work and keep the blood thin to prevent the stroke. But unfortunately, you know, there is a lot of effect, outside effect on the warfarin and INR, such as green leafy vegetables, you know, yeah. broccoli and all that will decrease the lipid because that has a lot of, it's a, warfarin is vitamin K antagonist, meaning if you take vitamin K, then the level goes down. So all those green leafy vegetables are high in vitamin K. So if you take a lot of vegetables, then the INR will go down and it's not effective or some certain antibiotics such as Levaquin, Zithromax, all those medications can also increase the level of coumadin and increase risk of bleeding. So there are a lot of uh, issues with the warfarin. Again, we used to give until recently. Now we have options of giving this newer medications, which does not depending on anticoagulation because it doesn't work. See, that's vitamin K. These are factor 10A inhibitors. So they are different than you know the warfarin. And it, we don't have to worry about the diet or medication or anything like that. Or we don't even have to check the label because it works on a standardized dose. So um, again, it's very important based on the risk factor, based on the chats to vas score, and based on the HESBLAD score to decide which medication is patient needed to be on to prevent the stroke. So atrial fibrillation is, uh, and again, those who cannot, they can have the this device, which is done at specialized center.